Easter greetings as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We welcome you wherever you are watching this worship service with us. We are glad you are here. We hope that you will find the service meaningful um, as though we would rather gather together in person. We are grateful that we are able to come here and worship God and join with you in all of our voices as we praise God in Easter tide. In case you weren't aware, there is a virus going around. Um, however, the life and work of the church continues, and we have many things that we would like to offer you through our church Zoom account. If you haven't already made use of this to gather together virtually with your group, either formally or informally, if you have a council or a committee that would like to meet, we invite you to reach out to one of the pastoral staff and the program staff to get you set up to use our Zoom account. It's been great to see faces and hear voices during this time, and our Zoom account is available for church folks to gather together in that way. I have a couple of announcements that I would like to make uh, re regarding the life and the work of our church. Stephen Kim's Bible study continues on Sunday mornings and uh, uh, studying the book of Galatians. So if you're interested in joining that, again, please reach out. We can connect you with Dr. Kim and that class to follow along in their Bible study. We also are excited that we have a new uh, offering that we would like to extend to 20-somethings. Our own Caitlin Chicozzi would like to gather together 20-somethings and talk about what it means to be in that age group, to uh, be on a faith journey together. And although we had hoped to start this physically in person, uh, we are going to go ahead and move forward using, uh, again, our Zoom account. And so if that is you, if you would be interested in meeting together virtually with people um, in your similar age group with Caitlin, I invite you to reach out to me, Pastor Aaron, uh, via email, and I can connect you with that, with that Zoom gathering. And we're really excited about the uh, possibilities uh, for a young adult ministry here at Abington. And finally, we want to make sure that if you find yourself in any kind of need for pastoral care or concern, prayer, or some kind of a practical need, uh, we invite you to contact the pastoral staff here at the church. We want to pray for you, we want to come alongside you, and see if there is a way that we could support you during this time. All of our friends and family members of Abington are in our prayers each week. <laughs> and we invite you to connect with us in whatever way is meaningful and helpful to you. Welcome. Please join me now in the call to worship as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship. The Risen One has come alongside us, joining us on our journey. Jesus, Jesus listens to what is on our hearts, walking with us every step of the way. Even when we don't recognize the divine presence, our Lord continues to be with us. As God's loving story comes to us, it transforms our story. May God open our eyes to recognize the power of resurrection that accompanies us. We celebrate the presence of the one who overcomes death itself. Alleluia.
Will you join me in the prayer of confession? Gracious Sister, God, we, we bring, bring before, before you ourselves, ourselves as, as individuals, individuals who are, are part, part of a faith, faith community. community. Your, Your caring, caring presence has been with us every step of the way, way. but we, we manage to overlook it. Every day your blessing has sustained us. However, we act as if we can provide for ourselves. We do thank you that when we have turned to you in our need, you have been there, comforting, supporting, and sustaining. We have neglected to pass on a similar care for others. Forgive us, O oh God in all those ways wherein we have wronged you, our neighbors, our own selves, and have therefore failed to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's mercy meets us where we are and opens a way for us to move forward towards God's gracious future. There is every reason for us to rejoice. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we, we are, are forgiven. forgiven. Alleluia. my friends, children, and all those who are watching, who are young of heart. It is a beautiful day out today, but I am not feeling especially happy. For this day, this particular Sunday, would have been our children's musical Sunday. And we have been practicing the Storytelling Man, a musical about parables, with 40 children since really right before Christmas. It is a special musical that tells the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, the prodigal son, and the good Samaritan. But more than that, it is a culmination of many years of singing and music making, praising God and worship that our uh, children get to experience this, and especially today, I think about our sixth graders. It's not that it's a bad thing or terrible that we're changing how we live right now. It's important, and I know that. And I am very much full throttle a part of being home and being safe and making sure everybody is okay and healthy. But every once in a while right now, a day comes when we had something planned, and I remember, and I think about the things and how it would have gone, and I feel a little sad. So I'm feeling a little bit maybe like those disciples that you're going to hear about in the gospel reading today. They were walking on the road, and they were very, very sorrowful about Jesus. And they had not yet really come to terms with his death and how sad they were and the change that occurred in their lives immediately in the days that had preceded. Sounds a little familiar. And suddenly they were joined by someone on the road who was talking with them and they were telling their story of their grief and how much they had lost 
and how sorrowful they were and how afraid. And they didn't realize until later that that person walking with them was Jesus. So right now we know Jesus is raised. It is Easter, and we know that Christ is alive. But once in a while, I know I am afraid, and I am sad, and I wish things were different. But I feel Jesus walking with me, reminding me that it's not so much longer until I see all of you again, and we will sing again together. And I am even hopeful that these sixth graders, Christian, Ella, Jackson, Lily, Zine, Adam, and James, we will have time to do something special again together. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you walk beside us always that you know our griefs as well as our triumphs, that you are with us in sadness and you elate with us when we are joyful. Thank you for your presence always with us and for your enduring love. In your name we pray, amen. Let us return again in prayer. O God, thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Even when our eyes are closed from pride or from sorrow or from exhaustion, open our eyes and our hearts, O God, that we might see and hear the word of the risen Christ, which proceeds from the mouth of of God the Father, through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from the Psalms, Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4, and then 12 through 19. This is a psalm of deliverance. It is a favorite of the New Testament writers. Listen for the word of God in your life. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our Gospel reading comes from Luke's account of an Easter afternoon resurrection encounter on the road to Emmaus. We share the story from the 24th chapter, starting with verse 13. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, 
What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered Jesus. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? What things? The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they did not see Jesus. Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to the disciples the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Were not our eyes burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word, the word of, of the, the Lord. Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. When our children were young, some of their theological ponderings had to do with questions about God's location. The old traditional answer that had been shared with many generations was that God is up there in heaven overseeing that which is going on down here. As any of us journey through life, we may also struggle with a similar question, particularly when significant challenges are occurring leading us to ask, where is God in this time of need? That may have been the question that was on the mind of two journeyers, one who was named Cleopas, and the other was named, well, Luke doesn't tell us who that second person was, but they were both followers of Jesus who were distraught that he had been executed by the cruel process of crucifixion on a Friday afternoon. On that following Sunday afternoon, they were process processing their feelings as they walked toward a town called Emmaus, just seven miles outside Jerusalem. The two of them were talking about the traumatic events they were trying to navigate when a third person began to walk along with them, who asked them what they were discussing as they walked along. The narrator lets us know that this was Jesus, yet he was unrecognized. A sense of despair can keep us from clearly seeing what is right in front of our faces. 
In response to the stranger's question, we're told the duo comes to a stop, looking sad. They express surprise that he would not have heard about the dreadful events that had taken place in Jerusalem in the previous days. It was almost as if someone asked us today what this coronavirus stuff is all about. Ironically, the two of them begin to tell this fellow traveler about Jesus. They said they had hoped that he would be the one to bring broad redemption, but, the, but that he had been cruelly crucified. And now it looked like their deepest hopes had also been put to death. Somehow, Jesus had not lived up to their expectations. That was the grief-filled story that filled their thoughts and emotions. There was, however, another significant narrative that Cleopas and the fellow traveler discounted. They had heard about some other followers of Jesus, some women, who claimed to have seen a vision of angels who told them Jesus was alive. Perhaps Cleopas and the other journeyer didn't want to risk entertaining new hopes that could easily get dashed. So they headed out of town. But they told their fellow traveler who had joined them about the rumor, saying, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. More irony here. These two followers of Jesus, looking at Jesus, not recognizing him, are telling him those others did not see him. So we have Jesus meeting the two of them where they were and journeying along with them. He listens to the pain, the despair that is in their hearts. However, he then begins to connect their story to God's larger story in the Hebrew scriptures as a way to help them be aware of a larger context to the current narrative. The journeyers then reach what they thought would be their destination for the night. The third person on the journey seems to be going on. But Cleopas and the other person urge him to stay with them. They didn't want him to be out there walking alone in the dark. Was it an act of kindness or an act of interest to ask him to stay? Something had happened to these two as they had been journeying. Something, or more, act more accurately, someone had overtaken their hopelessness. Life that had been drained of meaning was being given new life. And they wanted that, they needed that to continue. Luke describes what happened next. So he, the stranger, went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. What led to their eyes being opened? Sure, it was after that regular moment of eating became a sacramental moment when the guest becomes a host, takes bread, blesses it, and breaks it in order to give it to them. But I have to imagine Cleopas and the unnamed person would have still been in the dark had their risen Lord not found them in their time of great need and walked along with them if he had not listened to what was on their hearts and cared about their pain, if he had not connected their story to God's story. Yes, there is that moment of recognition about the one who is present with us. 
whose presence makes all the difference in how we interpret what has happened and what is possible. But it may require all those previous moments to reach the moment of recognition about the living one, the source of our liveliness, who indeed is present also with us in our current journey. We need not worry about whether we take all the right steps to reach recognition of God's presence, for the road to Emmaus story shows us that when his followers need him most, the risen Lord finds his followers and journeys with them, journeys with us. When the two of them have been trying to come up with their own answers to the confounding world as they perceived it, Jesus came into their midst and redefined their world. I don't think resurrection can be proven, but it can be experienced as we realize that our risen Lord is present with us, even in, particularly in these times of confusion and bewilderment. It happens when we pour out our hearts with our pain and loss, when we listen for how God's story intersects our story, when we receive physical and spiritual sustenance at the Lord's table or at a table in our home. Yes, this was a story about Cleopas and a person Luke does not name. Perhaps the gospel writer has left this name unidentified to be filled in by the reader, to be filled in by your name or by mine. Their bewilderment journey became a faith journey, a resurrection of faith journey. They were so filled with vitality by what they had experienced that they changed their minds about their destination for that day and rushed off to tell the others the great good news that they had experienced the resurrected one. And they got connected with others who also had been blessed by the presence of the risen Lord. They didn't just recognize the presence of their risen Lord, they were transformed by it. We are in the midst of quite a sad journey, one that has to do with great suffering and death. But we have a risen Lord, our source of faith and hope, who shows up to be with us in the time of greatest need, who listens to what is on our hearts, who enables folks like you and me to find new understanding of how God's life-giving power is at work even now, right before our eyes, if we will but recognize it. We then get to join in sharing that good news that God is not way up there somewhere, but rather comes into our midst and makes all the difference in the world. Yes, there were two who went on a journey. One of them was named Cleopas, and the other was named, well, you know. I invite us to affirm what we believe using now the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray. Most gracious God, we continue to worship and adore you. Your word says that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you are in the midst. We thank you, O Lord, for your holy presence. We humbly beseech you to hear our prayer. When the disciples were on the road to Emmaus, they were feeling confused after your death and resurrection. Yet you revealed yourself to them to ease their worry, their apprehension, their curiosity, and their disappointment. We too, Lord, need you to open our eyes that we may see you as the risen Savior. We have worry and apprehension, curiosity, and disappointment in our minds. During this coronavirus epidemic, many are grieving the loss of loved ones, losing their financial stability, losing their homes, and suffering from food insecurity. Children miss playing with their classmates and learning in classrooms with their teachers. Lord, we are continuing to practice safety measures to protect our families, our neighbors, ourselves, and our community during this COVID-19 atmosphere. We are doing all that we know how to fight this enemy. But Lord, we need you to ease our minds, our spirit, and our souls. Just as you met the disciples, we ask you to meet us in our uncertainty. As the risen Lord, we ask you to meet us all at the communion table. It is here that we are invited to eat with you and receive spiritual food for our journey in this life. We need your presence in our life, Lord. We continue to pray for the health and welfare of our nation and other nations around the world. We continue to pray for the leaders of our country to make wise decisions in which citizens' health and welfare take priority. We continue to pray for those working on the front lines in the hospitals, those who are in our supermarkets, those SEPTA drivers, and other drivers who provide transportation to workers or patients. We pray for those who have built additional buildings for testing. We pray for scientists and researchers and volunteers. We pray for those who are supplying food to the hungry. We pray for those who are advocating social distancing for those who are in the prison system. We pray, God, that you will reveal yourself in all people and that we would recognize and honor you in humanity. In your presence, we find joy unspeakable. In your presence, we find love everlasting. We find peace to soothe every part of our being. In your presence, we find loving kindness. We find goodness and faithfulness, and in your presence, we trust and believe that all will be well. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread. And, and forgive us our debts, debts as we forgive, forgive our, our debtors. debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time of our service that we offer to the Lord with thanksgiving, enjoy all that we have and all that we are. And I would like to say, read Psalm 116, 12 through 14. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. As the children of God, we want to be cheerful givers to the ministry of the church. And here at Abington Presbyterian Church, there are many, many ministries serving the surrounding community, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Whether a member or a guest, 
There are several ways to support the ministry and mission of Abington Presbyterian Church financially, other than offerings in person at the church. You can send in your offering through the mail, and it's very helpful that you would indicate your giving envelope number and your donation and indicate the intent of your offering, whether it be stewardship, capital campaign, property endowment, special offerings, music, mission, and make all checks payable to Abington Presbyterian Church. And for those of you who want to do it faster, you can go online on our website and you can make a donation there. In whatever way you can assist financially to build God's kingdom, it will be greatly appreciated. I speak for church staff here when we say that we miss you. We miss our church being filled with people, and we miss seeing families and children and worshiping together. I was thinking during the sermon that on the road, if Cleopas was there, that the other person might be our whole church. 
Abington Presbyterian Church walking on the path, searching and listening for the voice of the risen Lord. So let us continue yearning together, listening and looking for the presence of Christ in our lives until we can gather again. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and your families this day and forever. Amen. We'll continue our passing of the peace using sign language. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you all. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you all. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you all.